thank you so much for joining us again today at the Touching Hearts Ministries Church located in West Frankfort, Illinois, in the southern part of, of Illinois. And I know that we've got friends on the other side of that camera that have been praying for our ministry. I talked to many of you just this week. Uh, I have a special request for those, uh, not just in our church today, but for those that are viewing in our, our program today. Uh, Brenda and I have uh, a prayer warrior uh, that lives in Harrisonville, Missouri, and uh, her name is Gail. I won't mention her last name. And her husband, Steve, what a blessing they've been for our ministry for the past 11 years. And Brenda and I are on the phone with Gail uh, at least once or twice a month. And if we have a problem or something's going on in the church or maybe we have something that we need, we turn to Gail, Doug, for, uh, for prayer. She is a prayer warrior. And she had found out this week that maybe she has bone cancer. So I told her, I said, I'm going to bring your name out to our church and I'm going to put it on the air uh, for prayer for you. And so, Gail, this, is, this service is for you. We're talking about planting seeds. And in your prayer ministry, you have planted many seeds for Jesus Christ. So this sermon was for you, and I want you to be encouraged and touched today that God is going to take care of you, just like you prayed that God would take for care of so many people in your past through your prayer ministry. I believe the Lord is going to heal you and touch you today. So if we would, before we go to our text, and the text today is, you'll find it in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses 6 and 7. But before we go there at our church, we, it's a customary. It's a need. It's a paramount interest that we ask the Holy Spirit to come and guide us and direct us as we bring this message today, planting the last seed. Lovely Jesus, I thank you for this message. I pray that someone is enlightened today and maybe encouraged today that they may not be a scholar or have a Ph.D. in theology, but through their life, through their actions, they are planting seeds for Jesus. So, Father, be with this message. Guide us and direct us. Send thy Holy Spirit and your angels today to worship with us. In the name of Jesus, my best friend, amen. So if you'll turn in your Bibles, and there again, those on the other side of the camera watching this service today, get your pencil and pad out and write these scriptures down so that you can go over these scriptures after we go off the air today. It's in 2 Timothy 4, chapter, verses 6 and 7. It's called planting the last seed. Here's what Paul said. We talked about Paul today. For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure, Paul said, is at hand. And I love this about Paul. Here's what he says. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. And I have kept the faith. Don't you want to say that right before you leave this planet? Is anybody with me? I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have finished the plan that God has called me to do. And he said, I have kept the faith. And here's what Paul said in Philippians 2, 17. Let's not stop there. The life that I now live, serving Jesus, preaching Jesus, and praising Jesus, may lead to my demise by sacrifice. Paul was saying this, because of the life that I've chosen to serve Jesus, it may cost me my life. But Paul said, if it does, and it did, it's been well worth the journey. And everybody said, Amen. Now listen to this. He said, because of my faith in God, because I have planted seeds of faith, Paul said, I have planted seeds of encouragement and of hope. And I pray that because of preaching Jesus Christ, someone along the way may accept Jesus as their personal Savior. And Paul went on to say, because I have preached the resurrected Jesus Christ, there is a strong possibility I may be crucified. I may be beaten and beheaded. And it was so Paul was beheaded because he preached the resurrected Jesus Christ. Once I chose 25 years ago to accept Christ as my personal Savior, I was not only taking on the responsibility of spreading Jesus Christ across the world, 
It may be because I am preaching Jesus, I may suffer for that. Is anybody with me? But I feel like whatever I suffer will be well worth it when I stand before Jesus on Judgment Day. And he says, Donnie, I'm giving you the key to the new Jerusalem. And everybody said amen on that. Listen to this. As Paul spoke of his faith and of his certain execution, there was no self-pity. There was no remorse or sadness because of his present situation. And I love this about Paul. Even though he, on his way to execution, listen to this, there was no complaining. There was no griping because of the hardships. No complaining because he suffered as a Christian or as a preacher, as an evangelist. How many people, professed Christians that you've talked to, Kathy, you ask them how they're doing, they'll say, woe is me. <laughs> In fact, when you see them, you think, I'm not going to ask them how their Christian walk is because they're going to suck the life right out of me because of their negativism. Paul, on his way, the spirit of prophecy says, to having his head cut off, he, on the way, was still testifying and witnessing to the lovely Jesus Christ. Even on his way to being executed, he was still planting seeds of faith and encouragement and of hope. Is everybody with me now? Let's go a bit further. Listen to this. <laughs> Paul, and Peter as well, but we're talking about Paul now, had suffered, the Bible says, innumerable beatings, stonings, thrown out of cities, being thrown in prison, yet with peace and joy in his heart, he let his inner thoughts be heard. Listen to this. Paul said, I fought a good fight. What did he mean by that, Jen? Paul was saying, I have been an ambassador for Christ. Is anybody with me? I have been in warfare, he said, against man, and yes, against principalities of darkness. But in the end of his life, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have fulfilled God's plan for me. By, how did he do that? By and through the Holy Spirit that dwells in my heart, I have met every challenge. I have not faltered. I have planted seeds of joy and peace and contentment. Seeds that once planted by, listen, once we plant the seed of Jesus, that's all God asked me to do. It says that the Holy Spirit then waters these seeds. And then these seeds produce newborn Christians who in turn plant their seeds through testimony and living the life of Jesus. Once I plant the seed and someone accepts Jesus, then they plant the seed and then someone accepts Jesus. Is everybody with me so far? Now, planting seeds doesn't necessarily come by quoting Scripture constantly. You know, uh, ben and CJ and Doug played music today. They were planting seeds for Jesus. Amen? As we sang the songs out of our hymnals today, we were planting seeds for Jesus and the kingdom. It's not necessarily always quoting Scripture that we plant seed. Here's what the SDA commentary says, which I read constantly. Personal faith depends upon adherence to God's Word. Every Christian will guard the faith by his personal representation of God's principles. What are seeds? The seeds are God's Word. And God's Word can be planted through music, through testimony, through living the life, or preaching the gospel, or being an evangelist, or being a teacher, an elder, however it might be, or a deaconess, or a deacon, we're planting seeds for Jesus as we live the life for Jesus. Everybody with me so far? Listen to this. David Stewart writes this. Every Christian believer ought to be, and here's how he put it, and I thought this was interesting. David Stewart writes that every Christian believer ought to be a spiritual Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> now, the older folks here know who Johnny Appleseed was. I don't know, Ben, CJ, they're thinking, who? I even mentioned the other day, I couldn't believe it. Uh, what I do is I, uh, for our daycare, after school, I go to the corner, Trinity, and I wait for the bus, and uh, some of our daycare kids get off the bus, and I walk them to the house. 
I was over there the other day, Doug, and an eighth grader was standing there with me waiting for the bus to arrive. And I mentioned Gunsmoke and Matt Dillon. He said, who are they? I thought, what? What has the world come to? He didn't know who Matt Dillon was. I said, shame me on you. But that being said, Johnny Appleseed, everyone should become a Johnny Appleseed. Now, who was Johnny Appleseed? Johnny Appleseed was born, or Johnny Chapman was his real name, in 1774. And this Johnny Chapman started planting apple seeds in Pennsylvania and in Ohio and in Ontario and in Illinois and Indiana. He would plant apple seeds everywhere that he went. And not only did he plant the apple seeds, he made little like little orchards out of them. And he would build fences around these apple seeds and then they would grow into trees and he would go back every year taking care of the trees he became a legend across america for 80 years he was out planting apple seeds caring for the apple seeds and as he traveled he gave testimonies of his faith in his religion unfortunately his religion didn't rely upon jesus christ but he was still planting seeds is everybody with him his life was everywhere that he went he planted seeds, apple seeds. We need to be spiritual <laughs> Johnny Appleseed. Everywhere we go, we should plant seeds for Jesus. Mike Kathleenus, Mike, you're, you're going to bring your name out today. He is a man that is a believer in planting seeds for Jesus. Everywhere that he goes, to the gas station, to the grocery store, when he flies to Florida for his classes, for his carpentry, he's planting seeds everywhere that he goes for Jesus. Shouldn't we do be doing the same? Shouldn't we be Johnny Appleseeds for Jesus? They're still, they still don't know who Johnny Appleseed. I can see, Jay. I, ben, I see the look on your face. Who is this Johnny Appleseed? I tell you what, when you get home, get on the Internet and find out who Johnny Appleseed was. But I will say this for him. I do not agree at all with the religion that he had. But I, 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 I appreciate that everywhere that he went, he planted seeds, at least for his denomination. Is everybody with me so far? All right, let's go a bit further. I'm not finished yet. Listen to this. The Word of God, the Bible says, it is the seed whereby men are going to be and will be and should be born again. You'll find that in 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. Here's what the Bible says. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit of unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure and fervent heart. Listen to this. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. What is the seed? By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And here's what one writer says. We find here that the word of God is the seed. By adhering to its principles, any man will experience a new birth of hope and strength and character. Listen, apart from the Word of God, no man can expect any moral transformation and no spiritual regeneration. The only way that man's moral character can be lifted up is through the Word of God. And everybody said amen on that. It's not because he says, I think I'm going to be a better guy tomorrow. It's by studying and listening and meditating upon the Word of God that will produce spiritual regeneration. Listen to this. One writer puts it this way, Jan. It is the spiritual responsibility of all professed born-again believers to plant the seed of the Word of God. Listen, proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the living Son of God. And once I accepted Christ as my personal Savior, I took upon it as my responsibility as a born-again Christian to plant the Word and the seed of God everywhere that I go. Now, some may say out there, maybe in our congregation today, I'm not much of a talker. Your life does much more talking than your words. <laughs> your life. People are looking for somebody, somebody to have a mirror image of Jesus Christ. Sometimes the way you act in different situations, how you handle yourself in confrontations, maybe not by what you say, is how you live the life of Jesus. Everybody with me? 
You know, my brother Bob, I, I'll use my, he's not here yet. I'll use him as a perfect example. Uh, when we have a family, uh, whatever it might be, a uh, emergency, we'll put it that way. A family emergency. I mean, as all the Sheltons get together, well, there's a bunch of them. My brother Bob is there. And sometimes we've been through some, uh, some problems and sometimes some dire situations, like when mom was very ill. All the Sheltons got together. All the family got around the house. And Bob may not come out and pray, but one thing he will do, he'll just put your hand, his hand upon your shoulder. That's all I need. <laughs> That's all I need for encouragement. I remember Doug, Pastor Kenny Shelton, <laughs> When my father-in-law passed away, my father-in-law, Bobby and I, Brenda's dad, we were not just, I wasn't just his son-in-law, we were good friends. We fished together, and we sat around in the evenings and talked and had, had great times. When he passed away, I tell you what, it took, it took it out of me. And I remember at the funeral, we were all outside there, and we were standing around getting ready to, to bury my father-in-law, and I turned around, and Pastor Kenny went, that's all I needed. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> I'm here. This, this is all I needed. So sometimes it's not so much as what we have to say. It's our actions that will encourage and uplift people. Is everybody with me so far? Let's go a bit further. Now listen to this. Matthew 4, 14, 15, and 16. Here's what the Bible says. Ye are the light of the world. Who are the light of the world? All born again people. Us, the church. A city that is set, that is set upon a hill, it cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, now this makes sense, and put it under a bushel basket, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine, everyone that accepts Christ as their personal Savior, that profess that Jesus lives within their heart, let your light so shine that men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. Now listen to this. In the first chapter of John, Jesus is referred to as the light, the light of truth, the one in whom the Father is made known by His character. And here's what the Bible says. Let me break this down, Bob. The Word says, so let your light shine. As we accept Christ as our personal Savior, this writer says, He lives within us, and His presence illuminates our own lives. And the closer we are to Christ and in Christ, we become reflectors of His presence end of his characters it did make sense in jesus times to light a candle and then cover it up with a bushel basket does that make any sense how is that light going to be effective if it's covered up he is saying that if jesus christ is coming to your heart let it shine let her shine don't be embarrassed about talking about jesus christ and now the biggest <laughs> the best way that i see as i've traveled to bring people to Jesus is your own, we talked about it last week, Trinity, your own personal testimony. What Christ has done in your life. That's the number one way to bring people to Jesus Christ. Now listen to that. We're talking about the light, Jan, being within our hearts, Rob. Listen to this. But light, that light within me, must be continually supplied with power. And the power is the transforming power of the Word of God. The seed of God is the power that illuminates the light within my heart, mind, and soul. Listen to this. The light will continue to shine within us as long... Now, here, there are provisions. The light will continue to shine within us as long as we continue to study the Word. For again, the Word is the generator of that supplies power and knowledge and perseverance and consistency into the life of a born-again individual. You see the power of the Word of God? It is the power that generates that light within your heart, mind, and soul. Now listen to this. What, is the, what does the Word do? The Word of God is a light which dispels, it penetrates, listen, and it annihilates the darkness of untruth. The Word of God, as one author put it, is a seed, seed to be sown. It is a seed to be planted. The Word of God and the words of God are His thoughts. God's thoughts written on paper. These thoughts, these precious truths, are seeds of truth that must be sown, taught, preached, 
testified and sung throughout the world. Is everybody with me? Why are you preaching on this? Because we are so tied up in the worldly cares, in our jobs, with our families, with our children, with our grandchildren. Most of the time through the week, we don't give God a second thought. <laughs> We're just too wrapped up. How can I plant a seed when my hands are tied with my children? They're tied up with my grandchildren. I'm tied up with financial woes. I have health issues. How can I be out planting seeds for Jesus Christ? Well, we're going to find out in just a few minutes. Listen to this. The words of light, the seed of God, the words of God must, be, must not be kept in secret. They are to be shed abroad and throughout the world by light bearers. We are light bearers. Who are the light bearers, Bob? We are the redeemed and the saved. The children of God are light bearers. Now, listen to this. One writer put it this way. <laughs> you say, man, how many writers do you have? I don't want to set on my own personal opinion. I love to dig into other people's thoughts and writings. And I think that the, some of the SDA writers are some of the greatest writers that's ever been on this planet. But, uh, uh, but other than that, there are other writers in other denominations that have some wonderful thoughts. Listen to this here. We accepted our Lord by the word of the gospel. Someone introduced us to Jesus. They planted a seed in our hearts, and the seed began to grow. And the more growth, the more we image the image of Christ. Listen, that is why Matthew said, Do not hide or try to cover up the light of truth that has been planted in your hearts. And we as believers, we must spread, we must sow these precious seeds of faith, encouragement, and hope in everyone that we meet. Is anybody with me so far? Okay, now, we talked a while ago that we don't really have to preach the gospel or be a theologian on theology to, to spell out scripture after scripture. It's the way that we live. It's our actions that will bring people to Jesus. Let me give you a perfect example of that. I was on my way back from Kansas, Kathy. It's probably been eight, nine years ago. And I stopped in a city called Fulton, Missouri on my way back to get some gas. And as I pulled in, it was probably 105 that day, just incredibly hot. And I remember as I was, as I was pumping the gas, there was more sweat coming out of me than gas was going into the car. I mean, it was just pouring out. And that place was just packed. I mean, I don't remember the gas station it was. I was just full of cars. And all of a sudden, I looked to my left, and there standing was a lady, a young girl, probably 25, that was uh, at least nine and a half months long. I mean, it was right there. And she was standing there, and she said, Sir, could you help me? I said, You come to the right guy. What can I do for you? She said, you see that car over there? And I looked, Bob, and the whole front had, end had dropped out and the wheels were spread out. And she said, it, the front end has fallen out on my vehicle and I have been here all day and no one will help me. I have been from person to person asking for enough money to stay at a hotel till tomorrow when my parents can come from Champaign, Illinois to come and get me. Not one person not only will give me a dime, they won't even talk to me. I said, well, ma'am, you have come to the right guy on the right day. I can help you. And so what I did was, because God is good, I gave her enough money for a hotel. I gave her enough money for food. I gave her enough money to make the phone call to her parents in Champaign, Illinois. Now, the only thing that I didn't do, and maybe I should have as I look back on it, uh, she uh, was going to a hotel, and it was, Oh, I don't know, Doug, three or four hundred yards away, and it was miserably hot. But I was actually afraid to put her in my car because I didn't know what I, I didn't know if that was right or not. I didn't know where it, what was going on. Other, all I knew is she needed help. I wish I'd given her a ride now. But that being said, she came to me. God sent me there just for her. I planted the seed. I said, uh, I'm a pastor of Protection Hearts Ministries, and I'm going to pray that all will be well, and here's, here's the funds for anything that you need. I planted a seed that day. And it's not because it was Touching Hearts Ministries. Not because I was a pastor. Someone showed her an act of kindness. Can somebody give me a name of that? Just an act of kindness. And I know she'll never forget that. She'll never forget. Just one simple little act of kindness. Now listen to this. I believe that everyone that has accepted the word of truth. That Jesus is living 
uh, in their heart, minds, and soul that Jesus is a sacrifice and they are redeemed. They've been bought back with the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe that we will plant seeds. And I believe this. Now, uh, I, I hope I... Let me put it this way. I believe that when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, maybe I can put it in an analogy or an allegory, however you want to put it. I believe that once I accepted Christ as my personal Savior, I received, you remember that bushel basket we hide the candle underneath it? I believe that I received a bushel basket of seeds to plant for Jesus. Let me finish. I'm not done yet. And I've got this big bushel basket full of seeds for Jesus Christ, of planting seeds to bring someone to Jesus. So I started, get, I went into the internet about a bushel basket. If I had a bushel basket full of grains, kernels of corn, this basket would hold 100,000 kernels of corn. Uh-oh. <laughs> I believe that Jesus filled this basket because I'm a child of the king and I have a basket of over 100,000 seeds I need to plant before I die. That sounds silly. Think about it. 100,000. And I believe every day I can plant, take out of that basket, a seed, two seeds, five seeds, ten seeds, to be able to plant these seeds. And I want all of these seeds planted for Jesus before I go to sleep in Jesus. Is anybody with me? 100,000 blessings of seeds that I can plant to bring somebody to Jesus Christ. Now, you say, what are you getting at? I think of Paul. Paul was a believer in Jesus. He talked to Jesus. He didn't see him, but he talked to Jesus Christ. He was blinded. I believe that when he accepted Jesus Christ and, and God said, my grace is sufficient for thee, that even though Paul was in prison, done his best writings in prison, by the way, if he's on the street, whether he has been beaten, he still continually planted seeds for Jesus. I believe he thought, I got 100,000 seeds I got to plant before I leave this planet, my departure. And the spirit of prophecy says this, that on his way to being executed, he was joyful. <laughs> he was praising God. And all the way to the place of execution, that Paul was planting seeds for Jesus. She went on to say that the centurion guards that were around him, they were stunned. They thought, this guy's going to get his head cut off. And he's telling us about Jesus today. And get this. When he was executed, Jan, did you know they didn't allow the, 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 the people in the area to come? You know why? They were afraid that once they saw him executed, that thousands would be converted to Christianity. So they would not let folks in. But all the way there to his place of execution, she said that he testified of the loveliness of Christ. And that even as he bowed down, he was praising Jesus. And I believe right before his head was cut off that he planted that last seed and his bushel basket was empty. Can somebody give me an amen on that? I want, this is what I want, no matter how many seeds I got. I want them to all be planted before I leave this planet. And it's not necessarily what Donnie Shelton says is how Donnie Shelton conducts himself in the times of trials. So, you know, that gives me a chance. Now, I, I know this gets repetitious. But, you know, my mom meant a lot, not only to me, but my family. And I'm going to say this. To the last breath that she took, she was a warrior for Jesus Christ. There was never... <laughs> Brenda and I, the last six months had the privilege of going over to dad's house and give him mom baths and we'd try to cook food, whatever we could for mom. Those last six months, she never even uttered a why me or I can't believe this or any type of irant behavior all the way to her last breath. She was a warrior for Jesus. And I believe that when she took her last breath in that hospital, she planted her last seed. Can somebody give me any of that? Because some of the seeds that we plant are forever and ever. We have influenced somebody for Jesus Christ. Amen? I wasn't there when my brother Richard passed on. 
Doug, Jen. But I can guarantee you this. He displayed the image of Jesus until he took his last breath. And then Brother Richard planted his last seat for Jesus. Come on. That's exciting to think about that. But, we, but I have the responsibility once I accept Christ, I'm going to be planting seeds. If I'm not planting seeds, something's wrong. You know why? Because whether I like it or not, Doug, I'm planting seeds one way or the other, for the good or for the bad. I'm still going to plant seeds every day. <laughs> Come on. Oh, it's too quiet in here, honey. Next Sabbath before we come in, I'm going to put a bunch of Mountain Dew on the back there. That'll do it. I think it's an exciting thing I, I, that spiritually, Mom, Richard, Paul planted their last seed for Jesus. Because you know what? They continue to be planters until their last breath. <laughs> Joel was a planter of seeds till his last breath. Amen? Daniel was a planter of seeds till his last breath. Listen to this. Each grain, Blake, represents an opportunity to plant the seed in sowing this seed to another individual, an individual that died, that Jesus died for. I'm planting seeds for somebody that Jesus loved. Whether you like them or not, Jesus did. He loved them. And I'm planting seeds. And listen to this. Every opportunity that arises to share the gospel must be valued and the seed of truth planted. How many times have you said, Ben, man, I should have... I had the chance, and I didn't say something for Jesus. I've said it. I've done it. I thought, oh, man, I had the opportunity, and that opportunity may be gone forever. Listen to this. In a book called Christ's Objects Lessons. Has anybody ever read that book? Christ's Objects Lessons. You, she talks about Matthew 13, 37. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. She says that Christ came forth not as a king, but as a farmer. A sower of good seed. The word of God, she said, is the word of truth, she said, which is the seed that is to be sown to the lost and a lost and dying world. She called it incorruptible seeds. She didn't stop there. We as servants of Christ must go forth sowing seeds of faith and truth found in the word of God, the Bible. Is everybody with me so far? Now we're going to start getting serious. We see, listen, the planting of seed is not just quoting scriptures. Let's say that one more time. Opportunities are all around us every day. How is that, Donnie? In a kind word, a telephone call, and yes, even texting. <laughs> even in texting, you can plant a seed. Plant a seed of encouragement, demonstrating your concern and care for a person who is in need? We are all planting seeds. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 5 through 10. For we preach not of ourselves, Paul said, but of Christ Jesus. For God commanded the light to shine out of darkness, to shine out of nothing. It has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure, even in these vessels that the excellency of the power of God may be in us and not of us. Here's what he went on to say, and I see this every day, Trinity. We are troubled on every side, yet we're not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are cast down, listen to this, but we're not destroyed. Oh, what a powerful, encouraging seed that being planted by each word spoken by Paul. And here's what I went on to say. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life of Jesus might be manifest in my body. And here's what my favorite author writes. Listen to this. Here's what she said about Paul's execution. Few spectators were allowed at the execution of Paul for the fear of new converts as they witnessed the loving and forgiving spirit of Paul, who was well known, she said, throughout the then known world. The soldiers were amazed at the joy and the kindness and the humbleness of a man who was just moments away from decapitation. On the way, she said, to the place of execution, Paul planted seeds, still preaching the resurrected Jesus, still preaching the blood and the sacrifice and the love of Jesus. Then, 
at the last moment, just before death, Paul planted his last seed, praising the Lord as the axe came down upon his neck. Romans 12, 2 says this, Be ye not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Well, how do we do that? Listen, the renewing of the mind comes by reading, studying, memorizing, contemplating the words of the Bible. As we read, the Holy Spirit plants seeds of knowledge, faith, understanding, and comprehension of the Holy Scriptures. The study of the Word of God, listen, it produces sanctification, purification of mind, and it implants the Scriptures deep within the mind that they may use to comfort those in despair. And here's what one writer said. Changing our thinking will change our lives. The Bible says to be transformed, to study the Word of God, because changing, listen, changing our thinking will change our lives. Here's what it says in Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Anybody with me? Jesus, who was the light of the world, constantly used scriptures as illustrations. How did he do that? As teaching and preaching to heal, to reveal the lovely Father, Jesus was the planter of seeds that leads to eternal life. Now listen to this. A friend of ours has some a son and a daughter in law that have now moved to Germany. They were called to Germany to be school teachers over there, and they left America and left good jobs, by the way, and they took their two children. Now that they're in Germany, they have found out the Lord sent them to be caretakers and helpers in a growing church. Can somebody give them? They said it is the greatest blessing of their lives to be able to share Jesus in Germany, and she said the people in Germany are starving for the Word of God. Now they know why they were called to Germany. They were planting seeds for Jesus Christ. Listen to this. The Spirit of Prophecy says this. There can be no reaping unless God's children sow seeds. Mm. There can be no reaping unless God's children sow seeds. It is our responsibility, she said, to sow, thus the spirit waters and life springs forth and another creature is reborn, another creature is revitalized, another creature changes, they are transformed into the image and the character of Jesus. And here's what John 15, 7-8 says. We're going to close here in just a minute, Blake. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done for you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. (laughs) How can I bear fruit unless I plant a seed? (laughs) Here's what uh, Julie Cameron writes. It is simple. You can't have a garden without planting seeds. You can't have a ministry bin without planting seeds. You can't have a musical ministry for Jesus, C.J., without planting seeds. Come on, somebody help me. The spiritual realm, she said, works the same way. We must plant to have a harvest. Planting the Word of God instead of planting worldly seed. And listen to this. She said, you get what you plant. She goes on to say, Judy does, the truth that every word you hear, every word you speak is a seed. Wow, you are either planting seed of life or seeds of death every day. Here's what it says in Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life or death. What the tongue speaks has the power of life or death. And here's what she went on to write. You get what you plant. You harvest what you planted. The seed. The words that you speak will grow in your own life. You know, Mrs. White said you're influenced by your own words. She said, listen, the seed, the words that you speak will grow in your own life. And as we close, I thought we'd talk about the farmer, the farmer of all ages, the one who sowed the seeds for 33 and a half years. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, The ultimate, the champion, the farmer, planting seeds of righteousness 
and holiness. He preached the Word of God, history says, for three and a half years. And he lived a total life of 33 years. Planting the seed, Jesus did, every moment of every day till finally even Jesus emptied his bushel basket of seed. And here was his last seed that he planted. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Is anybody with me? Even Jesus, the Son of the living God, was given a bushel basket of seed to plant. And the last seed that he planted as he emptied his basket was, Father, forgive these people for crucifying me, for beating me, and for rejecting me. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. But he could have said, Father, I've got 12 men that are about to turn the world upside down. Through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God, these 12 men are going to plant seeds that will turn the world upside down. Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray that today's message was more of a teaching message, that we have a work to do, that once we accept Christ, our work just begins, that we have an obligation, we have a responsibility, we have a compelling force to plant seeds of faith and hope and encouragement and the gospel that Jesus is alive and resurrected and is the true Son of God. That is our responsibility. And thus fruit will be obtained. A harvest will be made when you come back to get your church. The seeds that will be planted will be new people born in the faith of Jesus Christ. I thank you for this message, Lord. I pray that they were encouraged, that they were enlightened, and that they now know that we have a responsibility as children of the King to spread the gospel of the lovely Jesus. I thank you for this message, Father. May we go forth today looking for every opportunity to plant a seed. Thank you for this message, Father. I pray in Jesus Christ, not just my Creator, but my best friend. Amen.